Hello and welcome to back to the Usage Report podcast, this one for week 12. I'm your host, Josh Shepardson, and you can follow me on Twitter where I post this at BeachHead50. And the first point time situation we're going to look at is one that is very familiar to many of you, and that's that of the Broncos' backfield. Uh, it's pretty much the same as it's been, uh, of late anyway. Ronnie Hellman played 38 offensive snaps. C.J. Anderson played 30 offensive snaps. Hillman nearly doubled up C.J. Anderson in carries, 21-12. to 12. And uh, Hillman bested 100 yards for the third game this season with 102 rushing yards, added reception for good measure. C.J. Anderson, for his part, was effective, carried the ball a dozen times, rushed for 59 yards, and added two receptions himself. In all, the offense ran the ball 36 times compared to 27 passes, and that's good news for the backfield. It looks like Gary Kubiak wants to play ball control with Brock Osweiler under center, would like to establish the run and uh, keep some balance, if not uh, tilting in favor of the running game, at least keeping it 50-50. And while that won't necessarily always be able to be the case down the stretch, possibly even this week it could be a problem against the Patriots since they are one of the highest scoring offenses in football, the idea is that as long as they are able to run the ball, they're going to. And uh, Hillman looks like an RB2, a low-end RB2, uh, the rest of the season as his workloads got become steady of late. And uh, C.J. Anderson remains worth holding on benches uh, in 12-team leagues or larger because he is running effectively again. He looks like a good complement to Ronnie Hillman. He's not usable unless something happens to Hillman, but at least he's running at a high level again. If Ronnie Hillman were to get hurt, C.J. Anderson would immediately plug in as a low-end RB2 or at least a strong flex play with the way that he's running the ball recently. Moving on to Green Bay, uh, playing time is not the same as it's been of late. Eddie Lacy reclaimed the starting running back job, or sort of reclaimed it. Played 41 offensive snaps against the Vikings to 33 for James Starks. Carried the ball 22 times compared to eight carries for Starks and absolutely crushed him in the yardage total. Uh, with 100 rushing yards compared to 14 for Starks. Both caught one pass. Starks' reception went for 30 yards. Eddie Lacy looked a lot more like the guy we saw in 2014, the guy who netted a first-round pick or a significant uh, portion of your auction dollars at draft time. I'm not ready to claim that he's back just yet, but at 4.5 yards per carry, was running the ball very effectively, had his longest run of the year in this last contest, 27 yards, Still looks um, uh, big. We'll call him big. Uh, was a little bit more nimble. Uh, you'd think that the week off possibly helped with his groin injury. Uh, he was able to cut a little bit better, looked more fluid. Granted, I mean, this isn't a Barry Sanders type back anyway, but he looked the part of a guy who is a true starting running back and uh, was, was pretty solid. But um, <clears throat> he's – going to be tough to rely on down the stretch. I do like this matchup with the Bears this week. Uh, It is a short short week. I am not super comfortable making this uh, recommendation to start him, but the Bears were just gashed by the aforementioned Broncos. Both Anderson and Hillman ran wild against them. Uh, I expect Lacey to run at a level pretty comparable to what we saw in the game against the Vikings. Maybe he doesn't get quite the volume that he got that game, but I think he can average around that four-and-a-half-yard mark, and if he gets 15 to 20, 20 carries, that should be enough to pay off as a low-end RB2, and I, I think that's a fair landing spot for Lacey, given the fact that we have seen him struggle at times this year, but he is coming off of his best game of the season. Unfortunately, that relegates Starks to backup duty, but with the way Lacey's played this year, you do have to hold on to Starks in the event that Lacey turns back into a pumpkin like he's been. The rest of the season, uh, Pumpkin didn't really mean that in relation to his uh, physique, but it works as well. So uh, if Lacey does, if the clock does strike midnight on Lacey and he turns back into the 2015 form of himself uh, that we didn't see this past week, the Starks will have value in 12-team leagues or uh, larger. So for now, hold on to him, see what Lacey does. If Lacey performs well again this week, uh, then you've got some decisions to make. But for now, you need to hold on to Starks. Looking at a less exciting running back situation, the Houston Texans played uh, Alfred Blue for 40 snaps, Jonathan Grimes for 20, Chris Polk was inactive. 
Uh, Blue dominated the touches department with 21 carries as well as three receptions on three targets. But as usual, Blue did very little with his carries, 58 yards on his 21 carries. Jonathan Grimes was much more effective, rushing for 37 yards on just his six carries and added three receptions of his own right in his own right. Um, Blue, I mean, is what he is at this point. He's averaging an ugly 3.3 yards per carry this year. And for his career, he's averaged 3.2 yards per carry. So if you include his work as a rookie last year, he's basically doing exactly what he did then. Uh, he relies on volume to have any value at all. He caught a touchdown pass this week, which helped him. And basically, as long as he's getting volume, he's worth rostering in 12-team leagues or larger. But he's only a bench option and an emergency fill-in at running back or uh, flex. I would say in, in leagues larger than, than 12 teams, so if you're in a 14-team league or something bigger, get on Jonathan Grimes. He's been the more effective back, even though he hasn't gotten the workload yet. Uh, he's averaged 4.8 yards per carry on 26 attempts this year. He's totaled 69 rushing yards on 12 attempts in the last two weeks. He looks the part of the better back, the more elusive back. And uh, – He's also the better pass catching back. Blue did catch a touchdown this week, but he's never really been involved in the passing game. Grimes has been. Uh, Grimes has a higher ceiling than Blue, and if um, Bill O'Brien gets a clue and ends up using Grimes a little bit more in, in the backfield, then you might have a flex value play in large leagues down the stretch. So if you're in a 14-team league or larger, go ahead and grab Jonathan Grimes, get him on your bench, because Blue's done nothing to continue to warrant his heavy workload. And with the Texans in the mix, you would think they might uh, be willing to tinker a little bit with that offense and try and get a little bit more production out of the running game than they've gotten at this point. The next running back situation we're going to take a look at is that of the Indianapolis Colts. And if you've been following this podcast or this article that I'm podcasting covering for any length of time this season, you know I've not been a Frank Gore fan. Uh, you know that I've been advocating getting rid of Frank Gore, dealing him in leagues where you can, because the return of Ahmad Bradshaw was bound to result in a workload split that Gore owners couldn't be happy with. Yes, he was nicked up this week. I will I'm not going to pretend like he wasn't banged up and that that didn't have something to do with the workload split, but it was exactly 50-50 between Gore and Ahmad Bradshaw, 32 offensive snaps for each, 14 carries for Gore, 9 carries for Bradshaw, 34 rushing yards for Gore, 32 for Bradshaw, 5 receptions on 5 targets for Gore, 4 receptions on 4 targets for Bradshaw, both touchdowns from Bradshaw, and this is a mess. The running game has not been effective for the Colts this year. It's unlikely to be more effective going forward with Matt Hasselbeck under center. Defense simply does not have to respect the passing game of the Colts, and they can go ahead and load up the box and take away Gore, Bradshaw, whoever is in that backfield. And the fact is, if Gore is at less than 100%, you can expect Bradshaw to continue to eat into his touches. Bradshaw was effective there last year. He's a more effective runner this past week. This looks like a committee situation, even if nobody's going to call it that. Gore uh, just hasn't been an electric back this year. He hasn't been exceptional by any stretch. Uh, this is not a, a good backfield to, to have a piece of, but um, with the state of running backs, what it is, these guys both weren't being rostered in 12-team leagues or larger, but they're really bench options only. Uh, they're worth plugging in as a flex when the matchup is right. This week isn't a great matchup. The Colts face the Buccaneers. The Buccaneers rank in the middle of the pack in terms of fantasy points yielded to fantasy running backs this year. And uh, it's it's not a great matchup. And uh, Gore's at less than 100%. So unless you're in an emergency situation, these guys need to be glued to your benches unless one of them emerges or one of them goes down to injury, leaving the backfield uh, solely to one of the uh, backs. Moving out of the final running back situation we're going to throw under the microscope, and that's that of the New York Jets. And I've been a big Chris Ivory backer for most of the year, but it's time for me to do an about face. Uh, inexplicably, the, Jet, the Jets uh, turned away from I, Ivory this week. It was a close contest, yet he played just 17 snaps. He totaled a season-low eight carries, ran for 36 yards on his eight carries, and uh, had one reception on one target. Bilal Powell crushed him in usage and in terms of – uh, 
snaps played, 41 for Bilal Powell. Four carries for 22 yards, seven targets, and five receptions. Powell is clearly the receiving back. And if the Jets fall behind, he's going to be the guy out there, which really lowers Chris Ivers' floor a great deal. Also muddying the situation is Stephen Ridley, who played nine snaps and carried the ball four times as well. So they do have another bruising runner back there. Um, it's not time to cut bait on Chris Iver yet. I mean, this is the first time he hasn't reached double digits and touches yet. But game flow is going to really be very important for his value going forward. This week they face the Dolphins. And the Dolphins uh, really haven't blown a lot of teams out this year. So this is expected to be a close game. You can expect Ivory to continue to get uh, a workload probably more in line with what we've seen in previous weeks. Uh, should reach double digits and carries again. Makes for a solid flex option. And uh, But Powell's increased usage, especially as a pass catcher, makes him at least a fringe flex play in PPR formats against the Dolphins team that has really struggled to stop the run this year. Uh, making putting both Ivory and Powell in play. But at this point, Ivory, with the emergence of Powell as a, a threat to his playing time, is really a matchup-based play and more of a flex and low-end RB2, and the floor is lower than ever. Moving out of receivers, let's uh, look at the Carolina Panthers first, and uh, let's go on a more positive side of things and, and look at Devin Funches, who played 61 snaps, led all receivers in snaps, was tied with Ted Ginn for the team lead in targets with eight, caught four passes for 64 yards and a touchdown. It was his second touchdown reception in his last three games, and he's tallied multiple receptions in three straight contests. He's also bested 40 yards in all three of those games. So he's uh, really starting to emerge. It seems like he's learning how to use his big frame in the NFL to uh, become a weapon with Cam Newton. Ted Ginn Jr. remains a uh, – Big play threat, a guy who has a handful of touchdowns this year, did catch another, was targeted eight times. I want to say he's a boomer bust candidate because uh, 37 yards and a touchdown on five receptions isn't exactly a boom. There is certainly some bust to his game, but uh, he is at least worth a bench spot in at least 12 teams or larger. Um, obviously, bench size determines whether he's rosterable in your 12-team leagues, but he continues to get targeted. But Funches, of the two, Funches is the receiver that I prefer going forward. And the only real reliable uh, pass-catching threat week-to-week -week remains Greg Olson, who was targeted six times, caught three passes for 54 yards and a touchdown. He's the clear-cut number one in the passing game. Um, beyond that, Funches is my next pick, and Ted Ginn Jr. is a little bit behind him. Uh, moving on to the Denver Broncos again. This time we're going to look at the pass catchers. And there was no Emmanuel Sanders this week. He was inactive. Uh, but – we did kind of want to get a look and see what would happen with Brock Osweiler under center. His first NFL start, he did use Demarius Thomas, threw him the ball eight times. Thomas caught three passes for 59 yards and a touchdown. It's only Thomas' second touchdown grab of the year, so certainly have to like to see that he found pay dirt. Uh, also targeted Cody Latimer three times. Latimer caught two passes for 22 yards and a touchdown as well. Second-year receiver filled in admirably for Emmanuel Sanders, but you'd have to suspect that when Emmanuel Sanders is healthy and returns, he could cut into Demarius Thomas' production. Also worth noting, Brock Eisweiler really loved throwing to his tight ends. Owen Daniels was on the field for 56 snaps. Vernon Davis was on the field for 47. Daniels was targeted five times. Davis was targeted six. Daniels caught four or five targets. Davis caught all six. Daniels total 69 receiving yards, and Davis total 68. So Osweiler doesn't have tunnel vision for his number one receiver, willingly spread the ball around, and they did play a ball control offense, running the ball more than they passed it. So um, while Thomas owners have to feel at least some comfort in knowing that Osweiler was willing to get the ball to his number one receiver, um, as I talk about in my Buy Low, Sell High article this week and on the podcast, I would cash out on Thomas now. I think there are some question marks around him. Obviously, you don't need to give him away. I would not advocate that. But uh, he's coming off of a decent showing, and uh, there's still a lot for Brock Osweiler to prove. So right now, uh, that's the state of the passing attack for the Denver Broncos. Uh, looking at the Indianapolis Colts, we got the third start for Matt Hasselbeck this, this year. And uh, there's really no – Mm, consistency from start to start as to who his number one target is. Uh, he, T.Y. Hilton led the team in targets in Hasselbeck's first two starts. 
but he totaled just four targets this game. Uh, uh, that was behind Dante Moncrief's eight. It was behind Frank Gore's five. It was behind Kobe Fleener's five. And it was tied with Ahmad Bradshaw's four for the uh, fourth highest total on the team. Uh, Moncrief has had a couple of games where he's been frequently targeted by Matt Hasselbeck, but he also had one clunker where he was not tar- where he was targeted just three times. So uh, not really a consistent threat emerging in that passing game. He does seem to like to use Kobe Fleener a little bit. Fleener has 20 targets in the three games that, that Hasselbeck's been under center. So he is at least on the periphery view of uh, emergency tight end play, but he's not certainly not as slam dunk as a tight end one. Matchup based, maybe a low end fringe tight end one. As far as Hilton and Moncrief go, at this point they're flex options and uh, they're flex options in the right matchup. They're not even must starts at this point. This week, I think they are a flex option against the Buccaneers. If I were to roll the dice on one, if I had both for whatever reason, I actually have a little bit more faith in Dante Moncrief than Hilton, and that's based almost entirely on my my receiver size bias, but um, when you're dealing with a quarterback who has some limitations like Matt Hasselbeck does, having to pinpoint uh, a small receiver like T.Y. Hilton becomes very difficult, really doesn't leave him a lot of room for margin of error. Dante Moncrief, a bigger guy, does give him a little bit more wiggle room to miss with the pass and and still put it in a vicinity where maybe uh, he can go get it. So that's more of a gut feeling than anything that's relying on measurables more than maybe previous performance, and and it is also relying on the fact that Hasselbeck targeted him more than Hilton in this last contest. So uh, if I'm rolling the dice on only one, that's going to be the guy, but uh, both really are only flex plays as long as Matt Hasselbeck's playing quarterback. Finally, uh, the Colts' opponent this week is the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, and we got to see what Jameis Winston would do with Mike Evans and Vincent Jackson healthy. Uh, Still doesn't have Austin Safarian Jenkins back yet, but uh, with some competition for targets, Mike Evans was no longer a one-man show. He did lead the team in targets with seven, also led the team, was tied for the team lead in receptions with four, caught a touchdown pass, was one of five different targets who caught a touchdown pass from Jameis Winston this week, and he did lead the team in receiving yards with 63, but that volume of work simply isn't as great with the return of Vincent Jackson. Jackson played just three fewer snaps than Evans this week, had one less target, had uh, was tied him in receptions, and uh, was bested by just seven yards. He had four receptions for 56 yards and caught a touchdown of his own. So um, Jameis Winston seems to be willing to spread the ball around, even included Adam Humphreys in the passing game, five targets for uh, that resulted in four receptions for 50 yards, completed a touchdown pass to tight end Cameron Brait. Um, so Jameis Winston, as he continues to mature, seems to be willing to spread the ball around when he has some healthy options to pass the ball to. Vincent Jackson remains a must-start for me as he is a the leading receiver in this passing attack. And even in a week where he, the, the wealth was spread around by Jameis, Evans was still your leader in targets, receiving yards, and tied for the team lead receptions. Also did catch the touchdown pass. So he's the most reliant option in this passing game. He and Jameis Winston do have some rapport that they built up by playing together more than these other options this year. But uh, Vincent Jackson is back as a flex player, or possibly a wide receiver three. And while Evans' ceiling is reduced, still love him going forward. And uh, Vincent Jackson, I I can't see him being much more than a wide receiver or flex going forward. But uh, James Winston's stock certainly up with the uh, return of Vincent Jackson and hopefully eventually the return of Austin Safari and Jenkins. The more weapons he has, uh, the more wiggle room he has to check down to to, to more talented receivers and not simply rely on, on just Mike Evans. And with that, that's going to wrap things up for this week's usage report. Check out fantasyfootballcafe.com for all our great articles, podcasts, and for our very active forums with some of the most enthusiastic fantasy football gamers in the world. Get on there, get active, and have some fun. Until next week, good luck.